Sam. I'm going to so bring up recording. my screen. Thank you. All right. Sometimes this just takes a second. Um, all right. Can you all see the slides? Yes. Thank you. OK, so welcome. Thanks to Sam for hosting this session. This is closed versus open publishing. What are the options? How do I choose? What support is there? And there's a go link if you'd like to follow along with the slides or if you'd like to consult them in the future, it's go.uncg.edu slash OA0120. So this is us. I am Anna Kraft. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the coordinator of scholarly communications here in the university libraries. And I am here with my colleague. My name is Alyssa Nance. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the institutional repository metadata analyst. Thanks, Alyssa. And I'm going to so, turn off my camera. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I may do the same if I start experiencing some slowdowns. Um, we'll see. It'll be an adventure. All right, so this is what we're doing today. We're gonna briefly explain the differences between closed and open access publishing. We'll talk about the different terminology that's used in this area. There can be a lot of jargon. We'll think about reasons why you might select one publication type or method over others. We'll share some information about open access scholarship funding options that we can support. And we'll be glad to offer opportunities for questions and discussion too, if you've got questions at any point. We've got some acronyms that you'll see throughout these slides. I'm not gonna go through all of them right now, but this is just a little reference if y'all need them. First, a very low stakes quiz. So we've got a bunch of words on this slide. Most of them are colors, some of them are not. Do you see any that you think are not associated with open access? Feel free to put them in the chat or if you wanna turn on your mic. Um, there are a lot of words here and no worries if you get it wrong. This could be a, a confusing jargony area. Is anybody willing to type in a word that think, they think might not be associated with open access? Purple. Black, getting some good answers here. Thank you. Yeah, so actually we'll talk about each of these, but the ones that are currently not in any way that I know of associated with open access are purple, red, and silver, but that could change. So these are the, the current publishing and sharing models and methods for open access. And we'll talk about what each of these means. And then there also are some color designations from a system called Sherpa Romeo that tracks publisher open access policies. These aren't actually currently used by Sherpa Romeo, but they still get mentioned in discussions of open access. Some publishers still reference them. So um, that's why these are included. And these other ones, purple, red, silver, not related to open access yet, but um, they could be in the future. Things are always changing. What does all of this mean though? So open access, this is a publishing model and it's also a method of sharing published scholarship. So it's more than one thing. When materials are published or shared through open access, they're made available online and they're accessible to readers at no cost and without sign-ins or other barriers. So anyone can access that content for free. Closed access is the model that's been around a lot longer. It's when uh, usually there's a subscription Sometimes it's a personal subscription. Sometimes it might be an institutional, like a library subscription to a resource. And what we, uh, what you think of in the past with this is that you know you were subscribing to a magazine or a journal that would come to you in print. Now it's coming to you online, and generally the library is paying for it. And if you don't subscribe or your library doesn't subscribe, you're running into a paywall. So closed access can also be referred to as subscription-based toll access reader pays, or traditional publishing. And lots of different content can be shared through open access and through closed access, of course. Journals and articles are the most common ones that we talk about. We also see data sets, books, pretty much any type of research output can be shared through open access. What can you do with these materials? You can read from them, learn from them, share them, cite them, all of these things at no cost. But these materials are not licensed for you to edit or change or reuse the content in different ways in your own work, unless you're given explicit permission. 
there is a subset of open materials called open educational resources that are licensed differently and often have more permissive licenses that can let you do some of these other things. But that's not what we're talking about today. Why is this important? So open access accelerates discovery, enriches the public, improves education because these materials are available to everyone. And it removes these paywalls that we run into. Here's an example of one uh, that I ran into when I was trying to access an article that we don't subscribe to um, from a journal we don't subscribe to. So it can be quite expensive to just get an article from one of these journals. What else can open access do? So there's this thing called the open access citation advantage that uh, that term has been applied because studies are regularly showing that articles that are made available through open access tend to have higher citation counts than those that are published through subscription or toll access. How much of an advantage? This really varies. Here are a few recent studies from 8% to 40%, so a lot of variance here. And there's not consensus about the exact percentage that you could expect. There can be a lot of factors at play here, including disciplinary factors. But studies are continuing to show that there is an advantage in terms of the number of citations that you can expect if you're publishing openly. But the decision about where to publish is really up to you. This is part of academic freedom. So you get to decide where you want your work to be published and how you want it to be shared. We're gonna quickly go through some OA publishing models. We looked at these terms on a previous slide, gold, diamond, et cetera, but what do these mean? So gold open access is traditional or journal-based open access. It's when the whole journal, all of the content is shared openly. And it's the journal that is deciding, all right, we're gonna be an open journal. We're gonna let anyone on the internet read the content. And usually these journals, instead of being funded through subscriptions, they're being funded through what's called article processing charges or APCs. So the authors are paying a charge to be published in the journal. Diamond open access takes, takes things a little bit further. This is also known as platinum open access. Again, this is a fully open journal. Anyone can read the content. The journal is making that decision to be open. But these journals are actually funded or subsidized through the institution or organization that's shouldering that cost. So there are no APCs with diamond or platinum open access. So this is even better for authors. Everyone gets to read your article and you don't have to pay for it. Green open access is called self-archiving. So this is when you as an author are publishing in a closed journal, but you are deciding to share your article in a repository that's open access, like NC Docs that we have here at UNCG. You can only do this if the journal or publisher policy allows self-archiving. Some of these can be complicated. We'll talk more about that in just a little while. So this is where you get to decide. If the journal allows it, you can say, okay, I want to uh, put my work in NC Docs. And then anyone on the internet will be able to get to that content through that repository, not through the publisher. And there's not an APC in this method. Hybrid open access is when you've got a traditionally closed journal, subscription-based journal, that offers authors the option to pay an APC to make their work OA. So the journal or publisher is determining that they have the hybrid model, then the author gets to decide, all right, I don't wanna pay, I don't have funding, so this is gonna be closed only for subscribers, or I do wanna pay the APC, I want my article to be open. So most of the journal content in this situation would be closed, limited open access content would be available to all readers. And there are definitely APCs in this model. And uh, this is not a popular model, in libraries because generally what this means is that libraries are paying to subscribe to the whole journal and then authors are paying again to uh, make their work open so if especially if the library or institution is funding those apcs it can mean paying twice for this content so not ideal but still does uh, make some content open Bronze open access is not a model that was developed. It's a term that's applied to something that uh, has we've seen happen. So this is where 
publishers are making content available on their websites, but they're not licensing it openly. So they could change it at any time. And I think this often happens when publishers don't really understand what open access is. Um, so this, this uh, open availability could be revoked at any time. And there's no guarantee in this model that the content is gonna remain open. And like that, black open access. So again, this isn't a model that was set out to be a thing. It's a term that was applied to something that people were doing. So this is also, this is what uh, what's happening here is the content is free to read, but it's not free by permission. So the content has been made available by someone other than the copyright holder. You may have heard of Sci-Hub repository. They are known for doing this. So someone other than the copyright holder is putting up an article and anyone on the internet might be able to access it. No guarantees though. Access is blocked in some countries, materials may be taken down. So this isn't an ideal model. This isn't something that we are striving to support or have happen. This is just something that uh, I'm sharing because it's, it's out there. And since we're talking about colors of scholarship, uh, white papers and gray literature, these are both separate from open access, but they both can be shared through open access. So a white paper is a report or guide that informs readers about an issue and presents the issuing group's perspective. It's meant to help people understand an issue, solve a problem, make a decision. Generally, they're not intended for publication, but they're shared more informally. And they can be shared openly, but they, it's a separate thing from open access. And a white paper is a type of gray literature. So these are materials and research that are produced by organizations outside of traditional commercial or traditional academic publishing and distribution channels. Lots of things are gray literature, theses and dissertations, annual reports, preprints, working papers, et cetera, et cetera. Again, they can be shared through open access, but they don't have to be. And now Alyssa is going to talk about determining publisher policies. Thank you. So I'm going to go about uh, how to, I'm going to cover how to go about figuring out what kind of open access sharing policies apply to your publications or prospective publications. Um, you may want to know how you can share your work because it's already been published, but you may also want to know um, how you would be able to share your work when you're choosing where to submit it. Um, one important thing to know is that publishers don't necessarily all have the same policies for all of their journals and policies do change sometimes significantly. Publishers also don't all use the same terminology. So the meanings aren't always consistent across the field. Um, so it, it's important to look pretty closely at policy details and not assume too much. Next slide, please. So where do you go to find publisher policies? Most uh, sharing and author reuse policies are available somewhere on the publisher or journal website, uh, but sometimes they aren't, or there's only instructions for um, non-authors to request permissions and uh, that's inconvenient. Uh, I'm going to go into it more in a moment, but Sherpa Romeo is a really useful resource for locating sharing policies um, on publisher websites. Um, information about how you can use your published material should also be in uh, whatever kind of publication agreement or contract that you sign uh, prior to publication. And if it comes down to it, you can also email the publisher. I always try to find a contact information for someone who works in rights and permissions, but sometimes the only contact I can find is a journal editor or general contact email address. Next slide. Sherpa Romeo is an open access product of JISC, which provides tools and systems for higher education in the UK. It's a database that summarizes publisher open access policies and author sharing policies for individual journals. Um, publisher policies often vary from journal to journal. So each uh, Sherpa Romeo record is for a specific journal rather than a publisher as a whole. 
I use it as a starting place almost every time I need to check permissions for articles that faculty want to deposit in NC Docs, which is the UNCG Institutional Repository. Next slide. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, this is a screenshot of the main Sherpa Romeo landing page. You can search by journal title or ISSN if you happen to have it on hand, um, or by publisher if you don't have, or if you have trouble finding the specific journal in the database. Sometimes the title isn't listed exactly the way I expect it to be, but I am able to find it through the publisher list um, of journals. Next slide. This is a screenshot of the top part of the Sherpa Romeo record for the Journal of Community Practice. It includes the ISSN's homepage for the journal, the publisher, which is Routledge, AKA Taylor and Francis, um, and the organization affiliated with the journal. Next slide. So before we look at that record a little more closely, I wanna to touch on a few terms that are possibly familiar to you already, um, but are really pretty important to understand when you're looking at policies. This slide breaks down um, the different versions of an article and some interchangeable terms you might see. The preprint is the original version of a manuscript that is submitted prior to any peer review. You may also see it called the author's original manuscript or the submitted version. Uh, the postprint is the version of a manuscript after it has undergone peer review and correction, but does not include any typesetting or other contributions by the publisher. It's also called the accepted manuscript, um, and this is the version I'm most often permitted to use um, in NC Docs. The publisher version, of course, is the finalized typeset version of the article that may include other enhancements from the publisher, and publishers often call this the version of record. Next slide. Thank you. Embargoes are a common condition that publishers require for making uh, publications open access through a green OA policy. The length of embargoes can vary widely from journal to journal, even from between different journals from the same publisher. I'd say Embargoes of 20 to or 12 to 24 months are most common, but anywhere from six to 36 months isn't unusual. Um, and some publishers have just done away completely with embargoes, which is great. Academic social networks and scholarly collaborative, <laughs> collaborative, oh, I put collaboration. Scholarly collaboration networks are things like ResearchGate, Mendeley, and academia.edu. Um, and I'm not 100% sure those terms are completely interchangeable, but I see them both applied to the same types of sites and used in similar ways. Um, so if you're considering sharing to an SCN or academic social network, it's important to know that not all publishers treat all networks the same way. Um, so you should read the publisher details very carefully if you want to post to a commercial or for-profit platform that has not signed on to the STM voluntary principles of article sharing, which I will link to down here. Um, the most popular and common SCNs that are often excluded explicitly from sharing permissions are ResearchGate and academia.edu. But I'm sure there are others. Uh, next slide, please. So returning back to the example journal on Sherpa Romeo, this information is the next section of the record. Um, it gives us information about different versions of the article and how each might be used um, and shared under what conditions. Um, in my work, I look for the most authoritative version that I'm able to post in the institutional repository, but you might also be interested in sharing on your personal or departmental website, or maybe to an SCN like ResearchGate. The Journal of Community Practice actually has 
different conditions for sharing the accepted manuscript version depending on where you want to share it. So it, it has two smaller sections for that version instead of one. The icons in each section represent different conditions on sharing, but each section also expands, and we'll look at that in a minute, um, where there's more complete notes about the requirements you need to fulfill. And down at the bottom of the screen, Shipper Romeo links out to the publisher policy documentation on the publisher website. And that's a huge help in finding what you need specifically. Uh, next slide, please. This is what the expanded information looks like. I can tell that I could put um, an author's accepted manuscript to the institutional repository. Um, I have to wait 12 months for the embargo to expire. The conditions say that the published source must be acknowledged, meaning I need to include citation information. And I must link to the publisher version, which I do, um, I try to always do it by DOI or stable URL if that's possible. It also says I need to include a set statement which is a passage of text defined by the publisher. And I need to go to the publisher website to find that. Um, and that's typically on the publisher's sharing or green OA policy page. Next slide. Thank you. So this is um, actually what part of that information looks like on the Taylor and Francis sharing policy page. Um, the second paragraph here indicates which uses, which types of uses are limited by an embargo. But because this information is general to all Taylor and Francis journals, you need to visit a different page, which is linked there, uh, to find the embargo period for a specific journal. So I would go there and verify that the Journal of Community Practice has a 12 month embargo. Um, the bolded and italicized text in the middle of the page is the pol or the set statement. Um, and in this case, it's very simple. And I would just copy and paste that and fill in the relevant information. Um, and I would include that with either in the document or um, on the page where the document is uh, when I post it. Um, so information that Sherpa Romeo did not include um, down in the second part of this uh, screenshot is that the accepted manuscript can be deposited under a Creative Commons license. And that's great for us, but um, you wouldn't have found that in the Sherpa Romeo record. I think they will probably update their records eventually, but this is a good example of why it's important to check um, behind Sherpa Romeo. Leaving off a Creative Commons license is pretty benign in the grand scheme of things, but sometimes there are pretty drastic differences between Sherpa Romeo and what the publisher policy actually says, especially if they've updated it recently. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as uh, Anna mentioned, Sherpa Romeo used to use all of these colors. Um, they underwent a pretty major overhaul a while back. Um, they no longer use any color system, but you still run into publishers using color to describe their own policies. Almost always green. Um, you do see those other colors that um, Anna mentioned. I generally see gold um, in conjunction with green um, for hybrid policies, um, gold not to be confused with yellow. Um, blue and yellow are essentially meaningless these days. Um, so I won't get into that, but you will often see publishers say that they have a green away policy, which was previously used to mean by Sherpa Romeo that preprints and postprints were both permitted to be archived or shared. And that's generally still what they mean. Um, publisher policies really just got so complex that a simple color system was not adequate um, to describe um, 
policy details. So next slide, please. So I know that sorting through publisher policies can be like pretty overwhelming at first. Um, until you get used to reading all of the details and terminology. So it can be tempting to take a look at Sherpa Romeo and call it a day, but I want to gently warn against this. Um, some publishers are very good about being clear and upfront about what their policy mean, uh, policies are, but not all publishers. <laughs> some publishers are very permissive and allow pop authors to retain a lot of control over their work post-publication. Um, and seeing that so often makes it kind of frustrating or surprising that some publishers have like very restrictive requirements. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanna quickly show you an example of what I mean. This is the information from the Sherpa Romeo record for the Academy of Management Review, which is published by the Academy of Management. Um, the icons indicate that you can share any version, the published and accepted versions, you can share with a Creative Commons license, and it looks like there isn't even a gold OA fee to share the published version, um, although there is an embargo on it. And this looks like a really generous policy, but once you look at the details, if you could go to the next slide, please. The under the notes, it says that these conditions apply only to articles accepted via the AOM green policy. Um, so what does that mean? Next slide, please. You have to go out to the Academy of Management site to find that information. Um, this is the page where they have their open access sharing policies. And it, there's a lot of information on this page. This is only the top part of it but they pretty clearly indicate that they have a green OA policy. Um, the problem is that they require authors to request that that so-called green OA policy apply to their articles. Um, and they have to make that request at the time they submit their manuscripts. And this information is pretty buried um, on the page. Uh, it's not obvious. Next slide, please. Next. Yay. Um, this information is from a document that's linked to from that main page. Um, it says that in order for an article to be approved for what they call green OA, there must be a funder mandate for open access and documentation of that mandate is required upon submission of the manuscript. Um, this is a very restrictive policy and not something I would expect from a, something purporting to be green OA. Um, Sherpa Romeo is technically correct, but you could easily be misled into thinking that you would be able to share your article um, unless you had kind of dug into the publisher policies. Um, it's frustrating for me because uh, I worry that people will have funder mandates and not dig deep enough to know that they actually need to uh, request this green OA policy application at the time um, because they have a funder mandate. They have to provide all of that detail um, upon submission. I don't know what the back end of it looks like. Um, through the article processing system. So that may be much clearer there, um, but there's no way to like retroactively apply it. So please email me or Anna if you have any questions about publisher policies. Um, they get pretty sticky sometimes. And I'll turn it back over to Anna. Thanks, Alyssa. Yeah, that, that example is a good one of, uh, a, a non-typical practice that is really not what we would expect or hope to see, but it's good to know that there are exceptions out there that are um, not really following what we expect. So what might influence your decision about where to publish when you're thinking about open access? There are lots of things that might influence your decision about where you publish, but when you're thinking about open access, 
You might be targeting a specific journal or open to considering places. You might be really committed to publishing openly or willing to be uh, open to self-archiving. And then if you have funding for APCs or not, this also might inform your decision. If you wanna publish in a specific journal, then you really are at the mercy of their policies. If they have a hybrid model, you'll have the option to pursue open publishing through the journal by paying an APC. And if the journal is closed, then you may be able to archive your work in NC Docs, depending on their policies. If you want your work to be open, but you're willing to think about open on publication or self-archiving, then almost any journal will work for you. If it's a closed journal, you'll wanna check their self-archiving policies. And like Alyssa said, if you need help with that, please contact us. And if you're pursuing self-archiving, make sure to submit your work to NC Docs after it's published. Just send us an email at ncdocs at uncg.edu and send us the DOI or a link to the article and we'll go from there. If you really want your work to be open upon publication, not just green OA or self-archiving, then make sure to check the journal policies first and then decide where to submit your work. There may be institutional funding for APCs if you're publishing in a gold journal or a hybrid journal that has article processing charges. So we have some funding I'm gonna quickly talk about here at UNCG. If you have co-authors at other institutions, they also may have funding available to them. So definitely think about that. If you don't have any APC funding though, your options really may be limited to those diamond and platinum OA journals. And there are far fewer of those journals than there are gold journals. So not all disciplines may necessarily have um, an appropriate journal that is gold or that is uh, diamond or platinum. So what support is there in these areas? We can help with evaluating open access publication venues, with finding funding to support APCs, and with sharing OA scholarship. So we could talk about all of these things in whole presentations. We're not going to do all of that today. Um, just some quick resources. Think, Check, Submit is a checklist to walk you through evaluating journals, making sure that you're submitting to a journal that is legitimate and not a predatory journal. There's also a very detailed rubric called Journal Evaluation Tool that is available freely online, and that can walk you through some of the considerations for thinking through what journal to publish in. We also do presentations on this topic pretty regularly, and three recent slide decks and recordings are shared here. So those are available. And if you need help evaluating a journal, a publisher, or a conference, please reach out. This is something that we help people with pretty regularly, and it's always better to check before you submit your work than to find out after you've already sent off your work that it's actually a predatory journal. With funding, we have the Open Access Publishing Fund, which offers up to $1,500 to offset the cost of publishing in OA journals. And if you are a full-time faculty member, a full-time EHRA employee, or an enrolled graduate student, then you are eligible to apply for uh, one of these awards every year or to receive one of these awards every year if, uh, if you apply. Here's an online application form and a LibGuide that has more information. These applications do go to a small committee that reviews them and there's more information about the guidelines for what's acceptable on that guide. If you've got questions, please ask. We also have some deals where we're working directly with publishers to offer discounts and credits. With Cambridge University Press, we have unlimited APC waivers. So if you are publishing in a journal that offers open access, either a gold or hybrid journal with Cambridge, you can publish there for free. We have a 10% discount with Sage on their gold OA journals. We have APC waivers with IGI Global that can be applied to journal articles and to book chapters. We have a 10% discount with MDPI and brand new as of January 1st, we have an APC waiver pool with Wiley. And some people are already taking advantage of these, which is great. More details about all of these are at our guide, go.uncg.edu slash OA. And can you combine these discounts and OA publishing funds? 
Yes, if you're publishing with Sage or MDPI, this would be uh, relevant that you could apply that 10% discount with either of those publishers and then use OA Publishing Funds as well. All right. And if you know colleagues or students who this information would help, please let them know. And if you have questions or want to share your experiences from using any of these deals, please tell us. We would love to have more information to help inform our work in this area in the future. And now Alyssa is going to talk about how you can share through GreenOA with NC Docs. Thank you. So what do you do if you want to make your scholarship OA but don't have funds? Um, email us at NC Docs to see if we can post a version. Next slide. So NC Docs is the UNCG institutional repository. We preserve and steward the scholarly out. Bleh. We preserve and steward the scholarly output of the university, um, and we are committed to providing a stable, long-term platform and support for sharing that scholarship. Uh, we can also help faculty members fulfill public access requirements set by granting and funding agencies. Um, many faculty also like that um, their NC Docs profile show usage um, of their works in download count statistics. Next slide, please. This is an example of what an NC Docs profile looks like. We can include a profile photo, contact and biographical information. The profile also lists the faculty members included works and shows the download counts for each file. Next slide. How do you get a file? Again, you email us. The centralized email, as Anna mentioned, is ncdocs at uncg.edu. You can send us a current CV, publication list, copies of the items or even a list of citations. I, the NC Docs team will look at everything, will assess the publisher sharing permissions and take care of everything else. Um, next slide, please. If you're not sure that you have the version that we need to post, don't worry about that. We um, will assess that. Um, we can usually handle the version issue, but we'll let you know if we need anything else from you. Um, typically, we're able to handle differences in uh, version policies uh, with no problem. Next slide. And great news, many publishers are establishing policies that allow us to post um, book chapters, which is Fantastic, and we will be happy to check on those for you as well. We're also happy to deposit your white or gray literature. It's very common to post conference papers, posters, research reports, presentation slides, um, that kind of thing. So please email us if you have any questions, need any changes or updates, um, we'll be happy to help. All right, y'all, we are wrapping up here. So if you need a reminder on any of these topics or if you want a session on one of these topics that we've talked about today for your department, your course, your research group, please reach out. These are things that we are glad to do um, as needed for groups on campus. And if you've got questions, now is the time. So you can feel free to put in the chat or unmute. Um, and if questions come up later, our contact information is here. Um, so yeah, thanks to Sam for facilitating today and for running this webinar series. And we are really grateful that y'all came to hear about all this information today. Thanks so much. Thank you. So the next one coming up, I'm putting it in the chat, is on February 22nd at 12 p.m. on um, Sam, you. I think you muted yourself. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, if you want to sign up for that and do any other recordings um, or look at the recordings, it's here. Um, the sign up information. Um, please fill out the assessment, but um, 
you will get a link to the assessment as well as a link to the slides um, at, in the email follow up. I'm putting the slide link in here as well. Um, edu slash OAs. And that's it. Thank you all um, for coming. Thank you, Alyssa and Anna. And everyone have a great week. Thanks.